I've been really excited about this. Um, this is kind of a new thing for me, and so I am really excited to have been asked and really excited to be here with you guys. I just want to introduce myself a little bit. My name's Emily Smith. I'm from Little Rock. I grew up here. I have a picture of my family, I think, here, so I'll show you who I am um, in context of these people. Um, this is my family, my mom and dad, and then I have an older brother who's married, and they have four boys, so all of those children belong to my brother. And then my sister is recently married and expecting a baby with her husband, Ben. So that's my family. They all live in Little Rock, except my parents live in Tulsa, but the rest of us hang out and, and live here together. Um, I'm from Little Rock. I went to Central High School. I went to Washita Baptist University. Um, and then I went to medical school here in Little Rock and then did my pediatric residency also here in Little Rock. So I'm just kind of a homebody. I'm from here. I love this city. I love this state. I love the things um, that the Lord has allowed me to be involved in here. So thanks for letting me be here with you. I am... I've really enjoyed this study so far. I think looking into our identity in Christ is something that is really important always probably, but especially in these times where this pandemic has shifted everything that we know, all of our roles, all of the things that we define ourselves with, the activities we get to do, the people we get to see. Um, it just changes things and it starts to make us feel a little bit shaky. And I think looking at who we are in Christ gives us a foundation that cannot be shaken. And so we looked in the first week at what it looks like just to live the Christian, the Christian life, to have been saved, to walk it out through sanctification, and then to ultimately hopefully get to glorification one day. And then we talked about what it's like to be created in God's image and how that is imparted on you when you're created. You don't have to earn that or work for that. That is just who you are. And then these three these three next things together are how we relate to God the Father as a beloved child, how we relate to Jesus as being saved as saints, and then today we're going to talk about how we relate in the Holy Spirit and what that means for our lives. So our focus of our passage is, or the focus passage is John 15. If you want to turn there with me, there's part of it that's on your handout. I think we're going to have it on the screen as well. And I'm just going to read through the whole passage together to kind of set the tone of what we're going to study um, here together. So in John 15, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Will you guys pray with me? God, thanks so much for this time that we have together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how much you love us, God, and that you give us these things to show us how to relate to you and how to live a life that brings you glory. God, I pray that you would speak through these thoughts and ideas and through your word tonight and that you would reach out to each woman who's listening, um, that you would meet her where she is, Father, and that you would show up in a way that makes us feel more and more connected to you and more and more grounded in the identity that you have given us. In your name we pray, amen. So we're going to start kind of as the chapter does by talking about identity theft. What are some things that take away or change the way that we think about our identity in a way that was not really intended for us. So our identity theft here tonight, I'm going to say, is that our worth comes from what we do. It's so easy to believe that the things that we do define who we are and make us worthy. So even my introduction to you, I told you what I do for a living and who my favorite people are um, so that you can then maybe understand where I come from and who I am and I think that's very similar no matter where you go. You're going to find people that are defining their worth by what they contribute to the world. 
um, in a secular space? What job do they have? How many degrees do you have? What does your bank account look like? What kind of car do you drive? Um, and these measures of success, even in the secular world where people are just churning and hustling and bustling, um, and I, I created a word cloud that I'm going to have them put up just of some things that I came up with um, on the next slide that if you think about just this churn, it, all these words kind of came to my mind. We're hustling. We're anxious. We're on this hamster wheel that Jasmine called it in the chapter. Um, we get exhausted by that, right? We just have all these things to do and all these things that hold us down. But that's where we feel like we're getting our worth when we just work really hard at it. And even in the sacred space, we're working really hard. We're at church in, when the doors are open and we're serving in this community and we're trying to love our husbands or raise our kids or do all of these things that are really God-given tasks to do. But if done, removed from the power of the Holy Spirit, it's exhausting. John says you, you wither away because you're not connected to the vine. So we kind of have this idea of glorifying our busyness, right? If we meet each other, how you doing? I'm fine. How's life? It's good, but I'm busy, right? That's the first thing that a lot of people say. And that really is relatable to everybody's life. It really doesn't matter. It's not, it's not by comparison. Everybody feels busy. Um, and so there's a book out there now um, called The um, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's written by John Mark Comer. He is a pastor and an author who works in Portland. And he proposes that hurry, this churn, this exhaustion that we have, is the great enemy of spiritual life. And that we cannot sit and be still and hear the Lord because we have so many things to do and so many places to be. There is, uh, he talks about a cardiologist in there from the 50s who recognized that in his patients who were most at risk for cardiac disease and heart attacks, those people were kind of type A. They always seem to be hurrying and in, in a hurry. And he defines hurry sickness as a continuous struggle, an unremitting attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time. And I just read that whole sentence and I just start to get a little bit anxious. Um, and so that is, if you are interested in this idea at all, of this idea of hurry and how can we get ourselves out of that hurry, I s highly suggest the book. It's a really easy read, and it just talks about our life in our culture and how that, and what are we trying to achieve here? What are we trying to do? In our book, Jasmine gives the biblical example of the Proverbs 31 woman who kind of sets this standard of how can we even live up to that and even postulates maybe she doesn't do all those things in one day. Maybe this is just like a summary of her life and some things that we should maybe look, look to do. Um, and I'm going to bring another example of um, my friends, Mary and Martha. So Mary and Martha are sisters. They have a house. They're friends with Jesus, and Jesus and his disciples are coming by, and Mary and Martha want to host them, as any good southern woman would want to do, to host uh, Jesus and his disciples in their house. And Martha is working really hard, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. So this is what it says in Luke 10, uh, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And I don't know if you know, but this, I struggle with this all the time. So I told you about my sister, Sadie. Um, obviously, we grew up together in the house that we lived in. But then as young adults, we chose to be roommates together. And we lived together for seven and a half years. And I am Martha, and Sadie Smith is Mary. And so if you have ever met her, she is so relational. She will sit at the feet of whoever is here. And I am over here, like, trying to get the kitchen clean. Like, come on, we got some, like... And I think there is a place for both of those people, right? Jesus was hosting his disciples there. Somebody had to feed them, right? Somebody to clean up. There had to be enough chairs for them to sit in and water for them to drink. So there is work to be done. But Martha's mad about it. She's like, Jesus, come on, tell Mary to come help me. And I think we run ourselves ragged like that, right? We run ourselves ragged trying to prove that we are worth something. Like, Jesus, I am worth something to you because I am serving you and I'm doing all these things. And who are we trying to prove that to? Are you trying to prove something to yourself? Are you trying to prove something to the people that you loved? Are you trying to prove something to Jesus? I think in this moment, if Jesus really cared about how much work we do, he would have been like, you know what, Mary, you are right. You need to go help Martha and do those things. And that is absolutely not what Jesus does. So if you look on into verse 41, he says, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. 
And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. How interesting. Jesus said, yeah, there's work that we got to get done. But Mary sees the value of sitting at my feet and learning from me and spending time with me, and that will not be taken from her. So the theft is that our worth comes from what we do. That is not true. That is not what Jesus says. That is not what he values. So he says, we're going to move on to our identity truth, that our true worth comes from Jesus' work on our behalf. Jesus says, listen, Martha, Mary's got this thing figured out. True fruitfulness is going to come from resting. You say, what? How are we going to be fruitful? How are we going to be productive if we're not doing anything? Um, and this is an idea that, in my mind, reminds me of this upside-down kingdom. We studied Matthew together um, a couple years ago, and one of the main themes of the entire book of Matthew is this upside-down kingdom, right? The last will be first, and the humble will be exalted, and blessed are the poor in spirit. And Jesus came and he said, this is what is valued in my kingdom, and everybody around him was like, what are you talking about? And Jesus made his kingdom available to everybody, but everything was flipped on its head. And so here we find ourselves be seeing that fruitfulness is coming from rest. Let me show you some psalms that kind of paint this picture of this stillness and this rest. Psalm 23, 2 and 3 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, and he restores my soul. Psalm 37, 7, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. In Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So this sounds a lot different than the, the churning and the hamster wheel and the checklist and all the things, right? So how, how do we get there? What do you mean this work that Jesus has done on our behalf? What are you talking about? So first of all, we can stop trying to prove that you're worth something. You didn't do anything great. You just were you. And Jesus saw you. And he thought you were valuable because God created you. You're made in his image. And he showed you what you're worth because he said, you know what? I'm going to die for you. You didn't do anything, and I love you. I'm going to die for you. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't do anything to deserve that. Jesus just said, you are valuable, and I see your value before you even can do anything. So why are you doing all of this churning to try to earn my value or try to define your value? Secondly, Jesus eliminated our need to work for salvation. The standard has been set. If you're going to earn your way to salvation and eternal life with God, you've got to be perfect. You've got to not need forgiveness. Um, and I don't know if you know, but none of us do that. Psalm 14.1 says nobody does anything good. And that sentiment is repeated again in Romans 3, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We cannot do it. You cannot be good enough to earn yourself salvation. So the rest comes in saying, well, I, I can't do that. Jesus did it for me. So Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, grace, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast. You cannot earn your way into salvation or right standing with God. And if you are trying to do that, I am here to tell you that you can be free of that thought. When you think of freedom in Christ, what does that mean? This is what it means. That you do not have to work your way into being valuable, and you do not have to work your way into a right standing with the Lord. And that's what we mean by rest, being able to rest in what Jesus has done. You can stop trying to prove you're worthy of love or affection or attention. You can stop trying to earn your favor with God. Jesus already saw your worth and you caught his eye. So he earned favor with God and gave it freely to you. And so you can rest in that. So our identity truth, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. Our true worth comes from what Jesus has already done. And there is rest in that. So you say, Emily, I thought we were going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Where, where does that come in here? What are, what are we doing here with that? So our identity transformed. We are only going to produce good fruit by the work of the Holy Spirit. 
So Ephesians 1.3 says that for all of us that have been saved and have a relationship with God, we have been marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So if you have chosen to believe that Jesus is God's son and that he died for you and he accomplished all of this stuff for you, you have now been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that is your own personal form of God's presence in your life. This is one of my very favorite things to think about. If you think back to the Old Testament, God, although he is omnipresent, his presence with his people was confined. He was in a cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. And then they would construct the tabernacle, which is like this moving tent. And the presence of God would live in that. And then they built a temple. And God said, I will be there. And so in order to be in God's presence, you had to physically go to those places. And the only person that was allowed to do that was the high priest once a year. But that's, that's God's experience or people's experience with God's presence. And then Jesus came and they took God's presence and put it in a body. And so to be in God's presence, you had to be around the physical being of Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going to leave. I'm preparing his disciples. He said, I'm going to go. And I'm going to, but it's going to be better for you in John 14, right before John 15. It says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives within you and will be in you. So that's the Holy Spirit. That's where we get him from. That's what he does. This is the presence of God living in you at all times. And so the presence of God can be felt among his people. I think that's why it's so amazing to be in a room full of worshipers because that is a room full of God's spirit. You house that within yourself and all you have to do is walk down the street and be like, I love your pretty son, God. And you can converse with the Lord in a way that we never were able to do before. And that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's God's still small voice. There, we, I could do a sermon series on the role of the Holy Spirit and what he came to do. Um, but I will tell you, it is our way to relate to God. The Holy Spirit is able to do that. So it's his still small voice. And a sensitivity to the leading of the Holy Spirit is a skill, I think. That has to be practiced in your life. You have to learn to listen for that. And if we're all in this hustle and this bustle and this hurry, how are we going to hear that? And I think that's why John Mark Comer in that book I talked about says this is the enemy of a spiritual life is because we don't learn to do that. And this is where the abiding comes in. So the NIV version that I read says um, remain in me. The one that is in the book says abide in me. So remain in me or abide or dwell or this idea of just spending time together. That phrase, remain in me, it's mentioned twice in verse 2. It's in verse 5 and 6 and 7 and 9 and 10. So maybe we should try to figure out what that is, right? <laughs> what does that mean, remain in me? And we can produce all this fruit. How do we do that? The message version um, says, live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In verse 9 it says, make yourself at home in my love. So again, that southern hospitality comes out, right? Make yourself at home. What does that mean? That means I can come to your house and unload your dishwasher. I've been in your kitchen enough that I know how to put the dishes away. Or <clears throat> I recently renovated a house that has two staircases, one in the front and one in the back. And I love back staircases. I think there's just something kind of intimate about that. And my brother-in-law, who's an architect, said, yeah, the front stairs, that's what you come down in your prom dress. The back stairs, that's what you come down in your bathrobe. You know, so there is an intimacy here. Make yourself at home with the Lord. You can't do that in one visit, right? This is a I'm coming to your house and I know how to go get myself a glass of water kind of thing because I have been here. This is, this is space that's comfortable for me. <clears throat> so in this time spent together, it's going to affect a few things. First, it's going to affect your character. And so we see that in Galatians 5.23, this really typical list of the fruits of the Spirit. is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are things that just come up out of you. Your character is changed when you have sat at the feet of Jesus and you have spent time there. Um, this is a familiar verse for a lot of people. Raise your hand if you know a song that in some way teaches you the fruits of the Spirit, right? Yeah, so if you don't, you should Google it. There's probably 80 million of them out there. Um, but I think sometimes the fruit of the Spirit can become a checklist to type A people who think, I want to be the best Christian, let me make sure I have all the kindness and all the patience and all the gentleness. And I think that's backwards, right? If you think I'm going to, again, if I'm trying to earn my favor, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to show God how good I am at being a Christian here, let me just show him this goodness. 
That is not how the fruits of the Spirit work. This is, he is the vine. You are the branches. You got to get your nutrients from him. You cannot produce your fruit unless you are doing it in and through a relationship with God. So if you want more kindness in your life, you can't just be like, okay, I'm just going to be more kind. You have to spend time with a God who is kind. You need to read scripture about the kindness of the Lord and what he has done for you so that it's in your mind. You need to sing some worship songs that proclaim God's kindness to you. And after some time spent in that relationship, lo and behold, you may have a moment in life where you can show some kindness. And that's where the fruit of the Spirit comes from. It it comes out of this relationship, this abiding, this spending time, making yourself at home in God's love. So also note, just for the record, that Galatians is not the exhaustive list of all the things you should achieve. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8 lists some other things. So he talks about some of the things that overlap with Galatians and maybe even adds a couple like knowledge and perseverance. So make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoa, 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 whoa. Peter wants me to be ineffective and unproductive, or he wants to keep me from being ineffective and unproductive. Does that mean I'm supposed to be effective and productive? Because that sounds like work, and you just told me I didn't have to work, right? That's what we're talking about. Um, So... The, the thing here is there is work to be done. In a life that is following Christ, he has got things for you to do. James 2, 17 and 26 says, In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action is dead. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You remember that verse back in Ephesians 2 that says you're saved by grace and not by your own works so that you cannot boast? Well, verse 10 then says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So do we work or do we rest? What what are we doing here? And I think the idea comes from the motivation. Are you working because you're trying to earn your favor? Are you trying to prove your worth? Or are you working out of this abiding? You have spent time with the Lord and the Lord has said, this is how I have gifted you. This is what I want you to do with your time. So we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit as he relates to our particular life and our relationship with the Lord to figure out where we are. There are some seasons of life where there's lots of work to be done and things for you to do, and that may be kind of exhausting. It's not always just um, besides still waters. I think there is an exhaustion that comes from doing the Lord's work that is from the Spirit. But that work is not soul-sucking. That is soul-filling work that leaves you exhausted because you have been doing the things that you've been gifted to do that the Spirit has called you to do. In Galatians, after that long list of the fruit of the Spirit, they call it keeping in step with the Spirit. So we have our own work to do and we have our own fruit to bear, but it is not to be done in an effort to earn things. And that's where the rest comes from. Is it, it doesn't matter if I get up here And everything I say makes no sense to you guys because I'm not earning my worth by how great this is tonight. Um, And I've had to preach that to myself the last couple of days, just for the record. Um, But I think there's rest in that, right? If you have pressure on yourself to prove yourself or to be worthy of attention or affection or any of that stuff, there is rest in knowing that God has already done this for you. So Paul has a prayer for his friends in Philippi. He says, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That sounds a lot to me like abiding, right? I want you to grow in your knowledge of the Lord's love for you so that you may be able to discern what is best. Do we rest or do we work? What what is mine to do here? And that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So what is the purpose of all of this is that the Lord would get glory, that people would look at your life, however exhausted you may be, and they would see that your strife or your effort or your work is being fueled by a connection to a vine. And their work has withered away because they are not connected to said vine, and they want to know what that is. You are bringing the Lord glory because you are producing fruit So Jasmine says in our chapter, I love this on page 61, she said, God will tell us when to rest and he will tell us when to strive. And the wisdom to discern what is best 
is where the abiding comes in. It comes from a relationship with the Lord. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So as we close, I just want to ask you guys maybe to close your eyes for a minute and think of all the things that you have to do even tomorrow or in the next week and the work that has been given to you. And why are you doing that? And what's the pressure that you feel? And, and have some rest in that. I'm going to read over you while your eyes are closed from the message in Matthew 11. This is a really familiar passage. I love the way that the message says it. And so I want you to, I want you to hear this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And that is my prayer for you guys this week, is that you would learn what that feels like to sit at God's feet and to just rest. That doesn't take away the roles that you play and the jobs that you have to do and the stuff that's on your calendar, but it will change the way that you see it. It will change the energy that you have when you do it, and that is what I am praying for you. Um, I am very connected to song, and music is something that really helps me sit at God's feet. The melodies focus my mind, the rhythm slows my heart down, and a lot of times the lyrics are things that really bring me into the presence of the Lord. Um, so music is really, really important to me. So I have created a playlist, as it were, if you want to take a picture of this, if you want to have it. These are songs that really speak to sitting before the Lord. And um, I have a friend who really only likes to listen to guys sing, and I didn't know that was a thing. So there should be a good mix of girls and guys and old songs and new songs. And um, these are songs that I have been listening to as I have thought about these ideas of sitting in God's presence and what does that feel like. Um, I walk to work, so sometimes I'll turn these songs on just as I am walking. Um, and it's just a reminder that God's Holy Spirit lives in you, and the abiding doesn't always have to be like sitting and being still. It can look like getting work done. Um, but I think spending time with God is really um, just an important piece of how, how we walk this out. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to send you off into your small groups, and um, hopefully you guys have some good discussion on fruitfulness and the work of the Holy Spirit. Dear God, thanks so much for this day. Thank you for this time that we have had together. I thank you for these ladies that have come to, to spend time in your word, to hear from one another, to be encouraged. Father, I pray that your spirit leads us, that we learn what it feels like to sit with you and to be comfortable with you and to make ourselves at home in your love. God, I pray that you guide our conversations and that you would ultimately get the glory of all of this effort. In your name we pray, amen.